Okay. Here we have Dr. Randall Allison. How would it be like people to interview on the, on the TV camera and they just quit talking and want to turn the camera on? Uh, we're going to talk about nothing uh, today and we're going to talk about everything because zero is both nothing and it's everything all at the same time. We take it for granted that we've got zero. All right, but this is really a weird concept. And we'll spend some time talking about how zero kind of got into us and talking about if we actually had anything uh, such as zero. Just to start you off, give you a little bit of a math problem. Um, I'll let y'all work with this one. Uh, Dr. Hastert's got a copy of the picture uh, to work with. That was taken uh, the Sunday before Labor Day. That's the Bastrop Fire in Bastrop, Texas. That's downtown Austin here in the forefront. Uh, you can see the smoke plume from the Bastrop Fire. They've now got it 80% contained. Uh, they've lost 1,500 homes so far uh, in the fire. It's gone over 50,000 acres. Uh, those smoke plumes are 30 miles away from downtown Austin. So y'all can figure out using your math skills. You can probably go online and figure out, find some information on the buildings here in Austin, find out the height of those, and try to figure out what the height of the smoke cloud is. Uh, and if you can find, try to figure it out, let Dr. Hastrick know. She may give you a bonus point on it. She knows how <laughs> tall they are. Uh, I've already given her the measurement on that. Don't go look up the height of the clouds. That's cheating. <laughs> okay. Uh, but actually get into it. And try to do the math and try to figure it out. It's very phenomenal. It's very awe-inspiring uh, looking at this stuff uh, as it goes through there. So that gets you going. All right. So how powerful is zero? Again, we think of this as a very simple thing. But September of 1997, the USS Yorktown uh, was out on her maiden cruise. Uh, she was out on her shakedown cruise. Uh, High-tech missile cruiser, best of the line. It's designed to take direct hits from torpedoes, bombs, everything that you could want to, to think about. But while she was on her shakedown cruise, the computer programmers forgot to take a zero out of the coding line. It was something they were playing with or toying with while everything was being put together and they were writing the code. They forgot to take the zero out of the coding before the ship went out to sea for a shake nine cruise. The zero hit in the coding while the computer's figuring out everything it needs to do. The computer tried to divide by zero. 80,000 horsepower of engines shut down instantly. All of the generators, all of the engines for the ship, everything shut down. It took the crew eight hours to get emergency jumpers in place to be able to get one engine running and to limp back into port with the Yorktown. And it took them over three weeks to clear the zeros out of the system because while the computer shut down everything, it's still trying to divide by zero. Uh, so this is a dangerous number, right? This is not a safe thing to work with, and most people have never really bothered to work with it. And we'll talk about why they deal with it. See, zero for us it is a natural thing. Now, we think about it now. We even start off a lot of our counting and things with zero, but it, it makes shadowy appearances. And this is very recent in human history that we've really worked with it. Uh, it does come from the Arabic word Sephir, and we'll talk about al Khwarizmi and uh, some of the Arabic uh, mathematicians that came up with this. Uh, the word Sephir means z translates into zero. Um, Fibonacci, some of the Europeans, when they started bringing it up in the Renaissance, uh, tried to Latinize the word, call it Zephyrus, uh, to get zero for it. Uh, but we also get the term cipher. Some of you all heard that term. It kind of means to, to do mathematical equations. We use ciphering as codes because numbers allow us to do a number of different things with it. The problem is that most math early on, and even a lot of math today for most people in the world, has more real applications than analytical or theoretical applications. So zero gives us some issues uh, that we have to do with. So who needs it? I'm early hunter-gatherers. If you're in my class, we go through the whole history of, of hunters and gatherers. Basically, I hate to use this, but B-grade films of cavemen. All right, hunters and gatherers. The majority of our world's existence of human beings, we've been hunters and gatherers. We've been nothing but hunters and gatherers until 10,000 years ago when groups of people became farmers at the end of the last ice age. Hunters and gatherers, you don't need zero. All right, you, you don't count zero. Zero means nothing to you. You don't count it. All right, so there's no reason to have anything in the concept of zero. For many of them, one and two is all they need. All right, for most hunter-gatherer tribes, when we look at what they've got, one and two are their numbers. Anything beyond that is much or many. All right. Some groups will say one, two, and three. All right. And then beyond that, it's like a whole bunch. All right. It, it just doesn't really matter to them. Uh, we do find groups like the Bukhari and Bororo uh, tribes in Brazil and the Brazilian basin. They count by what we call a binary uh, number system. Their numbers are one, two, one and two, and two and two. All right. So it's kind of a binary system. For the longest period of time, 
Two and two was as high as they got. Everything beyond that was much or many. Because they've been in contact with outsiders, we're beginning to see naturally within the Barora and Bakari is that they're now doing the one, two, one and two, two and two, and all in my hand for five. Uh, but that's as high as they get. Anything beyond that is a bunch, okay? You don't need it. When life is plentiful, when you've got all the things you need, what do you need a whole bunch of numbers for? Right? Numbers are magic. Right? Manipulating numbers is magic. Right? We even do that today. How many people have our study or ever looked at numerology? You know, within certain cultures, within Asian cultures, three, five, and seven are auspicious numbers. All right? They have certain meanings for us. Within our own culture, three is a magic number. Uh, we talk about the lucky seven. Uh, we talk about unlucky number 13. All right, 666, we don't like that, all right? Numbers for a lot of people in the world are magic, and, and people who can manipulate them, you know, they're kind of respected and a little bit feared, too. So for many people, anything beyond just what you need to describe, there's no sense in working with it. The Greeks, yes, they had zero, and they didn't want to talk about it, all right? Greek math, as you learn, as you're going to learn, is based on geometry. All right, and then the Greeks didn't have a positional number system, uh, per se. They used Greek words, Greek letters of the alphabet for their numbers uh, when they worked with it. Zero was absolutely shunned. Uh, they hated it because zero threatened everything. Zero messes up geometry, uh, especially for Pythagoras and for his followers. Pythagoras had a cult. Uh, his mathematicians who worked with him, it was a cult. It was a secret brotherhood. Uh, that worked with things. They didn't like irrational numbers. Right? They didn't like those, but when you start doing triangles occasionally, you're going to get hit with an irrational number. And so they finally had to admit, oh, okay, we've got that. The golden ratio, 1.168, 1 to 1. 1. 1. 1. 1.618. I flip my numbers around on a regular basis, which is why it <laughs> explains my math scores in high school and college. Um, they did work with it. Um, you know, for Irrational numbers, but zero was forbidden. You couldn't even talk about zero. It, it didn't work. Archimedes would come along um, and work with it and would have ideas and say, no, you can't have zero. It, it, it's impossible uh, to do that. Now, Dr. Hastert may have talked to you about Zeno's paradox, that you have a runner one foot behind a tortoise, and they both start a race, and you measure it. All right? You measure how long it takes before the runner can overtake the tortoise. The tortoise goes half as fast as the runner. Well, the problem with Zeno's paradox is that you never get to the end because the runner can run one step, but then a half step, and then a quarter step, and then a sixteenth, or an eighth, sixteenth, thirty-second, sixty-fourth, one-twenty-eighth. You just keep going and going and going. Zeno's paradox was that the runner would never overtake the turtle, even though our, con our, our com common sense would tell us, yeah, he's going to overtake the turtle. Why could Zeno's paradox work? because the Greeks didn't use zero. They had no idea of limits. Had they had the concept of zero, they would have understood the limits and would have understood Zeno's paradox doesn't really work. You actually come up to a limit. These things get smaller, they approach zero. But the Greeks, they didn't deal with it. Right? They, they didn't like it. It was a punishable offense to even talk about it. Pythagoras would kick you out of his group or you could get beaten to death uh, as one of his members. One of his members did talk about zero, talked about it publicly. They took him out on a boat and dropped him off in the middle of the sea and let him drown uh, to go through that. Now, for his part, Pythagoras had his throat slit by the villagers in the town where they lived because they feared him. Uh, they were concerned about what was going on with these numbers and they didn't like he was keeping things uh, to credit. For merchants, you didn't need zero. You were counting the amounts of goods. Right? You were counting the things you had. Zero didn't come into play. You don't count zero sheep, it doesn't matter. If you don't have any sheep, there's no reason to start counting. Everything <coughs> begins with one, it goes forward from there. So the Greeks, they didn't really work with it. The Romans, no. Uh, Rome was in charge of the world for 700 years. The handbook of famous Roman mathematicians over that 700 years doesn't even need a piece of paper that large to fill out. Rome sucked where math was concerned, quite frankly. They used what other people did, but they didn't develop anything on their own. If anything, they took all of the world with them backwards several centuries uh, where math came through. And, of course, their Roman numeral system, you know, trying to divide that becomes unwieldy, and in the Roman numeral system, you can't have decimal places. And so that doesn't work, and they didn't really worry about it too much. 
um, that didn't have a positional value system, neither did the Greeks. It didn't matter where the number was within these things. There was no positional values that go through them. The Maya, yes. The Maya had zero, and they loved it, and they worked with it. Uh, the Maya committed some really cool things uh, with their mathematics. Uh, if we look in the Maya Stella and the glyphs, they have this kind of eye-like feature. I think of it more of a shell. Uh, for zero, they use dots for ones, bars for fives, and then the dot and the, the eye shell for 20. All right, they actually started their accounts with zero uh, as they went through. They're really kind of a neat, I mean, it makes a whole lot of sense on the number system uh, to work with them. Um, like a number of cultures, uh, they did work with a base 20 numeral system, uh, which makes sense because you've got 10 fingers and 10 toes, so it's easy to count with that. Uh, but they use zero, they embraced zero. Uh, quite a lot within their workings and were able to do a lot with it. Um, they used zero within their calendar system and that becomes big because next year on December 21st everything's supposed to cease existing because the Mayan calendar runs out. That's a whole other lecture <laughs> to work with. But they used the, the, the calendar, they used zero to seat as they called it, to, to start a calendar. Uh, the Maya had two calendars. Uh, they had the solar calendar that most cultures use uh, it's made of 12 months of 30 days each, which means you get five days left over at the end of the year, and they had a five-day month that they stuck down. Uh, their ritual calendar was 18 20-day months with a five-day uh, countdown towards the end. Every 13 years, those two calendars coincide with each other, and every 52 years, you end a new century, or you end a century in the Mayan calendar. It goes through there. But they would start off with zero as the seeding app, so one of the sit Sit, sit, however you want to translate it, is one of their months. They start off with the seating of sit, one sit, two sit, on through until they get to 19 sit, then seating of salts coming in with their next month uh, coming in with it. So they utilize zero uh, to work very well. Mayan mathematics, it, we're still working with, I'm trying to understand all of the intricacies of Mayan mathematics. Most of you have seen the colorful weavings from Central America, from Southern Mexico. Right? And they're, they're really neat. Today, most people do them with multiple colors of thread uh, woven together. Weavings from the pre-classic period of the Maya, going back to the 1200s, 1100s in our time, those colored threads was a single thread knotted and dyed multiple colors and then woven back and forth to make that pattern. For those of you going into engineering, your second semester of differential equations, you'll get the math to be able to do just that. That's how powerful zero is. All right. For the rest of the world, they couldn't do it. The Maya could because they used, they understood zero. Uh, they worked very well with it. The Babylonians, kind of going out of order just a little bit. The Babylonians, no, they didn't have zero. Uh, they didn't use it at all. They got close. Uh, they did come up with wedge marks to kind of indicate zero, but they were using it more as a placeholder than anything else. They were trying to come up with a way of, let's hold this in place uh, for this. It kind of gave them their number system. Uh, but they know you don't see these zero marks at the end of anything, all right? just in, in the middle. It's usually got stuff on both sides of it for their count. No positional numbering system, uh, which gets it a little bit tricky within here because the same symbol can mean multiple numbers of things. What we rely on in nine math matter and Babylonian mathematics and a lot of times in our stuff is context. All right. How much for a tall coffee? 225. How much for a plane ticket to Denver? 225. We know that that means two different things. That one charge means two dollars and twenty-five cents. The other one means two hundred and twenty-five dollars. We have we go by the context. With we've got some holdovers of a lot of old math that allows us to understand some of these things. Uh, to work with it. So it comes this context thing. But still, you don't have to have zero to do anything with this. Context takes care of it. You know, it takes care of it. Now, the Maya did have it, but they didn't really need it. The Greeks didn't have it. The Babylonians didn't have it. The Romans, no, they didn't have it. All right? Do we actually need zero? Can you actually have zero? Let's find out. This becomes the interactive part of the program. <laughs> Oh, great, now everything's stuck together. I think poker chips. Well, that's rather embarrassing. <coughs> Take three poker chips each. Pass those on down the tables. 
everybody gets three poker.